Hello and welcome back to Char Reads. Huxley is really hot and he wants to go outside, but I want to show you to him because he has had a groom in the last month and he looks bloody adorable, doesn't he just? He is the best. I love him. But I'll let him go outside. I just really enjoy tracking what my dog looks like through the start of these wrap up videos. In the grand old month of May, I read five books. So let me talk to you about them. Um, the first was The Dutch House by Anne Patchett. This came out in 2019. Um, and I read this for my book club book this month. It is a sort of like family saga um, narrative about this um, sibling pair, Danny and Maeve. Maeve is such a great name. Um, and their relationship with their childhood home, the Dutch house. Uh, I made a full video on it. Um, I felt sort of like, I quite liked it. I feel like it, I was meant to love it. I mean, it's true of all books, right? The Dutch house never really spoke to me. Um, so it didn't pull me in as much as it could have, but it was a nice read. The second book I read also came out in 2019, uh, which is Homesick by Katrina Davis. Um, this is a memoir about her moving to an abandoned shed in Cornwall and turning it into a home. Um, I also made a video on this and I have a lot of thoughts about the premise. The premise that it is so difficult to house yourself and also have creative pursuits, have any freedom or control of your life when you're stuck in this um, rental market loop. I really like the aspects of um, building yourself a home and its direct connection to nature and all of the surfing. I love that. Um, but I don't feel very like politically in line with this book, I suppose. But who doesn't love another memoir about Cornwall? I could read them all. If you have any other recommendations of Cornish memoirs, I would love to hear them. Next up, I listened to Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Um, this came out just a few weeks ago. It is a sort of return to the uh, form of The Martian where it's just a guy out in space solving really big problems for the Earth. <laughs> Our main character, Rylan Grace, wakes up on a spaceship millions of miles from home um, all alone. Initially, he can't remember anything, but slowly his memory filters back in. So we get these sort of flashbacks of what's going on on Earth to lead him to be on the spaceship. The gist is that there is this biochemical sort of material um, that is invading our star system and sucking out the energy from our sun, which is very rapidly going to lead to the end of civilization as we know it on Earth. Our main character is a scientist on Earth and he studies this material and it basically, they figure out quite quickly that it can be used as like super efficient rocket fuel. So they decide this is the project Hail Mary um, to send out a spaceship to this weird star system that seems to not be affected by this invasion and find out what's going on there and how we can replicate that at home. He gets to the star system and there's another spaceship there. What? Oh my God, it's a, an alien. Literally, it's an alien. Um, and he and the alien team up. <laughs> they learn how to speak each other's language and they solve problems together. I did find the alien aspect quite alienating. I actually had no idea that it was gonna go in that direction, um, but cool. Uh, what I did annoy me was how quickly they were able to develop good communication. Grace called his alien friend Rocky, and despite Rocky's completely different way of communicating. Uh, they managed to collaborate quite well, which is one of the many problems I have with the film Arrival. Um, it all just seems a bit too bloody easy, <laughs> but it was a fun romp. Um, things that I especially enjoyed were uh, this woman Strat on Earth who'd basically been given high command to organize this mission and every leader of every country in the world will do whatever this one woman says to get this thing done and it's really interesting to think like how much resource <laughs> humanity would be willing to put into its literal only shot of survival there's also a certain amount of necessary mansplaining as there was in the martian and also similarly to the character of the martian uh very sort of like humorous jokey jovial um, narrator, but like it works. It works. I found it really, really fun. I was doing my puzzles and listening to my audiobook. I loved every second of it. 
Next book I have to talk to you about is The Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green. Uh, this also came out in the last month. Um, it is an evolution of Green's podcast by the same name, uh, in which he reviews different aspects of the human-centred planet on a five-star scale. I actually listened to this as an audiobook instead of reading it because I like listening to John Green's voice, uh, but maybe someday I'll come back and read it in the text, but I just wanted to send him some more money. Also, I super love this cover. I just think it's really gorgeous. When I first saw it, I was like, nah, and now I'm like, hmm. On the podcast and in his Vlogbrothers videos, John talks about how it's quite hard to write these essays because they're so personal and they're very autobiographical. Um, and listening to the pod, I never really got the sense of them being that memoir -y. Um, Like there was always uh, an autobiographical aspect to them because it's something that he chose because he cares about it and wants to talk about it. But in the format of them being bound up as a book, um, you really get the, the, the memoir narrative. It's sort of all of these little strings between the pieces, which makes it so much more emotional as a full piece. One of the first notes I, I wrote while I was listening to it was that it's a love letter to Hank. And then I wrote, it's a love letter to his wife. And it's a love letter to his old mentor, Amy Krauss Rosenthal. And it's a love letter to his best friends, Chris and Marina. I feel like I know far too many people in his life. <laughs> but as a collection of stories, it really uh, does turn into much more than a series of non-fictional essays. I was trying to convince my boyfriend to read this book and ask him if he'd listened to the podcast. And I think he'd listened to an episode or two that I'd sent him. And he was like, I just don't like the idea of reducing everything to like this single axis value. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's kind of the whole point. That's the, that's the irony of it. And I think that's a strong point in this as it is with my videos, I, I reduce things to a seven point scale. Um, but very often it's nothing like, firstly, it's a very personal thing. It's always, it should be. <laughs> ratings are meant to be personal. <laughs> if you're looking at an average rating, that is an aggregate of people's personal experiences. One should never rate things um, on a generalized scale. It's how you emotionally connected to the thing. And that's something I you know, speak a lot about on here. But the point is that you can't, you can't reduce it. You can't reduce it to, to a, um, a number, let alone a single axis, but it's kind of the human condition that we always want to try to, because we always want to be able to compare the uncomparable. And I think that's the wonderful juxtaposition in here is that telling these um, emotive, historical and personal stories about these topics and then ending it with, I rate it two stars. In many ways, I wish that I'd never listened to the podcast before this book came out so that it could all be brand new to me because I think maybe about two thirds of these were things I directly heard versions of on the podcast or, um, I mean, a lot of things are just, you know, shit that John Green talks about in all of his other content that I know about because I've absorbed from him in other ways because, you know, a human only has so many stories, right? But also like having those stories that I've already heard, like recontextualized in this order, in this format um, was really full. It was a very full experience. Um, and I liked it a lot. If you haven't picked this book up, do it. Also, I feel like it would kind of make a good gift because it's just kind of random shit. Um, maybe I should give this to my dad. The final book I have to talk to you about is Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. I can't even look at it anymore. Um, this came out in 1955. I read it when I was 16. I read it when I was 20. I did a review on this channel of it, in fact. Um, and I was very blinkered. I decided to reread it recently because I listened to a podcast called Lolita Podcast by Jamie Loftus and iHeartRadio, which is a proper dissection of this book and all of the, the cultural history of this book. And it really spoke to me because it made me realize how like miscontextualized this book had been for me. Um, and I wanted to reread it to understand how wrong I'd got it. Um, and to like honor the character of Dolores who is so often overlooked when talking about a book that should be entirely about her plight. I made another full video um, about this book which I would encourage you to watch if you've read Lolita before or if you haven't, just to get a perspective on it. Just a perspective. <laughs> That's it. That's all I can ask for. Huxley wanted to come back. He wanted to come back. <laughs> anyway, so that has been my um, 
my May, I hope you had a good May. I'm, I recognize that it's June now. Um, <laughs> uh, I am gonna be away for a lot of June, so I don't know whether that means I'm gonna get a lot of reading done or none. Um, usually when I say that, it means none. Uh, but, ooh, but I hope it means lots because I'm gonna be on actual holiday um, in Ireland for a bit and then in Cornwall for a bit, so that'll be nice. I'll see you next month. Bye!